uh, somebody very dear to my heart, a man, Evangelist Dylan Morgan. We're so thankful for him. He's been traveling, preaching the gospel since he was 17 years old. Uh, and we're so glad you're here. He's been at Awakening his Conference, which we sponsor and part of that conference. I remember you coming on a Wednesday night, and it was so powerful. And your preaching's always on point. I believe you got a word from the Lord. Would you welcome our evangelist for the Dylan Morgan as he comes and preach for us today? Amen. Come on, let's give him a big welcome as he comes to preach the word of God. The Holy Ghost is going to fall in this building. Praise the Lord, everybody. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning? My goodness, it feels good in here today. It feels like church in this house. Come on, why don't you just raise your hands and lift your voices all over this place, and why don't we lift up the name of Jesus one more time before we get into his word here today. Lord, I love you. I thank you for what I feel. I thank you for the miraculous power of the Holy Ghost that moved in here. God, I believe you're going to do a work in this place today. Come on, if you believe that, let's lift our voices unto him and let's magnify him. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. 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 What an honor it is to be back at the Anchor of the Wonderful, Wonderful Church. I love and appreciate each and every one of you. And it's always an honor to get to stand behind this pulpit. It's not something I take lightly. I hold your pastor and your pastor's wife in such high regard. In my opinion, there are a few greater in our entire movement as brother and sister bounds. And this is a very blessed church to have them leading you. And it feels like revival in this place. And I thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I, uh, I don't know of anybody that has impacted me from afar. And I say this just better time I get behind this pulpit as much as your pastor. And the more I get to know him, the more I realize it's just who he is. He's just a man that impacts everybody he comes in contact with, and I thank God for that. Amen. To my friend, Brother Up to Grave, his wife, I love and appreciate y'all so very much. We have a lot of fun together. We got to preach Louisiana camp together this year, uh, junior camp, not camp meeting. <laughs> and uh, and we, we stayed in the house together, and, man, we just had so much fun. And I love and appreciate him and his ministry. And I know this church is blessed for the entire staff that's here. Aren't you thankful for the people that God has given you to help lead you in what God's doing in this region? Amen. Amen. Not just in this region, but all over the country, all over the world. We thank God for that. I do feel like I have a word from the Lord here today. Turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 49. We will begin reading at verse number 5. Genesis chapter 49, beginning at verse number 5. And uh, I thank God for his word. I do feel like today that somebody's going to make a decision that will forever change the course of your life. I believe that in one moment, now this is just what I believe, in one moment you can make a decision that will affect not just you, but will affect your children, will affect your grandchildren, that will reach from generation to generation if the Lord tarries. I believe God's going to do something today that's going to rewrite the course of your lineage. I just feel that in the Holy Ghost. I prayed it all the way over here. I prayed it this morning. Getting ready, God, do something in somebody's life today that would change the direction of their family, that would change the direction, God, that they're on. Whatever's going on, God, I just believe you're going to do something today that's going to change somebody's course. You believe that here? Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 49, verse number 5. This is a unique scripture because Jacob has called his sons together. And this is a very profound moment because when a father would do this, as he would prophesy over his sons, it was something that would carry out. And when he gets to Simeon and Levi, some of his last words to them, he looks at them and he, he's getting ready to prophesy their future. And he says, Simeon and Levi, your brethren, instruments of cruelty, he said, instruments of cruelty are in their inhabitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou unto their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor. Be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. He was saying, I don't want to be counseled by Simeon or Levi. That's what he was saying. I don't want to come unto the assembly of Simeon or Levi. 
Verse number seven, he said, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, and I will scatter them in Israel. Such a unique passage, and not exactly the words you want to hear from your father before he dies. I curse you. I curse your anger. I pray God scatters you in Jacob and, and, and scatters you in Israel, divides you in Jacob and scatters you. These are, these are the last words that Simeon and Levi hear. However, when you look fast forward just a little bit, and I don't know if that I gave you this, you find in the book of Numbers that it was under the children of Levi that the covenant was established that the priesthood would come from. So for the next few moments, I want to preach to you on this subject simply how to change a lineage. How to change a lineage. One more time before we're seated, would you just pray that God would speak to you here today. God would speak to your neighbor here today. And that his word would go forward without fetter. He would speak to every person wherever they're at in their walk with God. He would speak to them here today. Lift your voices one more time before you see the Lord, I love you. I thank you for your word, God. I thank you for how I felt burdened for this service, God. For the people that are here, Lord. I just pray, God, that you would speak to each and every person that's here, Lord, right where they're at, God. I pray that you would loose the gifts of the Spirit into this atmosphere, God. Lord, that you would minister to people, God. Lord, that you would break chains, that you would rewrite futures, God. That somebody would be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. And somebody would be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. If you believe that's going to happen and God's going to do something great, I want you to worship Him and praise Him because He's worthy. Come on, just because He's worthy. Why don't you lift your voice and just praise Him? Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen, amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. This prophecy that would come over Levi it's interesting because as I've already said you find that it is from the sons of Levi that there is a covenant between them and God made that it would be the Levitical priesthood that would be those that get to experience the glory of God it would be those of the sons of Levi that would become the instruments of God's use as they work their way through the tabernacle as God gives it to Moses. They would be the ones that would offer the sacrifice on that altar. They would be the ones that would wash themselves in that brazen labor of water. They would be the ones that would go into that inner court and they would go to that table of shoe bread. They would go to that golden candlestick and they would go to that altar of incense and one time a year, it would only be those of Levi that would stand before that veil that separated them between the holy place and the holiest of holies. On the other side of that veil would rest the Ark of the Covenant that represented the throne of God on the earth where God would send forth the atonement that would roll the sins back for one year. It was only the sons of Levi that could experience the beautiful, powerful, awe-inspiring glory of God. I don't know about you here today, but I've not come just to have church. I've come to have an encounter with the glory of God. I don't know about you here today, but I have not come just to preach a sermon. I have not come just to enjoy good singing as we heard and good teaching as we've heard. I've come today that the glory of God would fall in this place. Come on, somebody. That the power of the Spirit of Almighty God would descend in this house. 
And it was those, the sons of Levi, they would stand there. They would have that swinging censer of incense. uh, And they would stand before that veil, that veil that was tied, that veil that could not be, be passed under or around. Something took place, something supernatural that transported them from one side of the veil to the other. And they would stand before that Ark of the Covenant. And they would sprinkle that blood upon the Ark. And at that moment, the sins would be rolled back at that very moment. You had to be a son of Levi. You had to be of the Levitical priesthood to enjoy that kind of glory, to be a part of that moment behind the veil. I'm thankful here today to know that Jesus tore that veil. The Bible says when he gave up the ghost, that veil was torn. That Bible says that now there's nothing that is separating us from the glory of God. We were aliens and strangers afar off, but today that veil has been torn and you and I can get behind and be in the glory of God here today the Bible goes a little further than that they would sprinkle that blood but that blood would only be good for one year and they would have to go back again and roll their sins back again but the blood that's on the mercy seat in heaven it's a precious blood it's a holy blood it's a blood like that not of goats or bulls or lamb or doves it's a blood my 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 it's a blood that was shed one time and when it was shed it washed away our sins forever you know how you apply that blood you lift your hands repent of your sins come on that blood is still speaking according to the word of God Come on, you better hear what I'm preaching to you today. That blood is still speaking. You know what it's speaking? He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Woo, my, my, my. That blood, that blood is crying out right now on that mercy seat in heaven. And it's crying out for you and it's crying out for me. And it's saying you are forgiven. If there was ever one that could have said, I'm going to hold you accountable for every sin. No, no. He said, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. And friend, we better enjoy the space of grace uh, because there is a day of judgment coming. But right now, that blood's saying, uh, I forgive you of everything. Can I preach about the blood just for a minute? (laughs) There's no sin that's greater than the blood. There's no transgression that's greater than the blood. There's no fault that's greater than the blood. There's no issue that's greater than the blood. There's no addiction that's greater than the blood. There's no lie that's greater than the blood. Come on. There's no no family issue that's greater. Nothing is more powerful than the blood. But you had to be a son of Levi in the Old Testament. What changed between the prophecy that was spoken over Levi and the covenant that was made with the Levites? It was that prophecy that said, you're an angry person. You're a vengeful person. You're the type of person. I don't want my my person. I don't want to be judged by anybody that's of Levi because of a mistake they made when their sister was treated uh, unfairly. They acted in vengeance and they acted in anger and dishonesty. And Jacob said, because of your mistake, because of what you did, he said, I hope I never have to darken your counsel. But now it was the children of Israel that would go to the sons of Levi and they would inquire of the Lord and the Lord would go and, uh, and the sons of Levi would go and they would, they would inquire of the Lord and they would seek the Lord an answer through the Urim and the Thummim and, and they would get an answer from the Lord. It would be the people of God that would come to the very people that Jacob said, I hope I never have to be in your council that is seeking counsel from those very men. What took place between what Jacob spoke over them and the covenant made with Levi? What took place? One man made a decision. One person made a decision. That man's name is Moses. You heard about him today at first word. That man's name was Moses. Moses was a man that was put into this ark and he drifted down the Nile. He was taken in and he was raised in the court and in the house of Egypt in Pharaoh. And one day you see a glimpse 
of his heritage come out of him when he's walking and he sees an Egyptian dealing unfairly with a Hebrew and that vengeance comes out, the vengeance of Levi, the anger of Levi, it comes out of him. And what does he do? He slays that man. He kills him. And then watch how the dishonesty works. He starts looking around. He says, did anybody see what I did? And instead of owning up to it, what does he do? He hides him in the sand hoping no man has seen. He comes back a day or two later and he finds out that it's known that he has slain a man in anger. You see that prophecy of Jacob on Moses' life. You see the prophecy of anger, the prophecy of vengeance that was spoken. You see it right there on his life. Uh, that which come from his father, Levi, it's alive and it's well in Moses. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh gets word about what Moses has done. Now watch, uh, Moses says, there's only one thing I can do. I've got to flee from Egypt. And the first place Moses goes, the Bible tells us, is to a well. And he's at this well, and while he's leaned up against this well, a young lady comes to the well, a group of young ladies, to water their father's flock, and herdmen run them off. And Moses runs the herdmen off, apparently, and he helps them get some water. I, I, I don't have time to preach that it's no coincidence that the first place he goes to is a well. Uh, Jesus said, if you knew what was standing in front of you, I would give you a drink of living water. You just think you want this well's water, but what's standing in front of you is a water you've never tasted before because if you get a hold of what I've got, you'll never thirst again. Uh, it's living water. When you get this Holy Ghost, uh, it's the kind of water that will quench your thirst forever. My, my. And so he's at the well. And he takes care of these women, and these women go back to their father, and their father says, how did you get home so quickly? What happened? It normally takes you all day to get the water for the flock. And they said, well, there's an Egyptian hanging out by the well. He helped us. And the father says, well, man, you, you better not leave him by the well. Go and get him. Why did you leave him there? He's clearly a good man. And they have supper together. Apparently the dinner went really, really good because out of nowhere, Moses is marrying one of his daughters. That's a pretty good dinner. It's going to take a whole lot more than one dinner to get my little baby girl, praise God. That's a pretty good dinner. He takes a wife by the name of Zephora, and, and he's, he's married to this woman now, and, and he has a son, and now all of a sudden Moses is out in the middle of a wilderness. He's out in the middle of a strange land, and he has a son by the name of Gershom, and that literally means I'm a stranger in a strange land. Now watch how God begins to work on Moses and begins to change the lineage of Moses. He said, Moses, i got to get you out of Egypt. And i got to put you in a place where you feel like you're a stranger in a strange land. He's wandering around for a long time. And he's wandering around with his staff. And he's just being a stranger in a strange land. Can I preach to you today? You made the decision to get a hold of this. You made the decision to get baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you went back home to your broken family. You went back home to your Trinitarian family. You went back home to your Catholic family and you just feel like you're a stranger in a strange land. Come on, you feel like you don't belong. You feel like you're an outcast. What am I doing here? Why am I here? Why am I all alone? Everybody else is against me. I feel like every, and you're just wandering around, wondering why does God have me in this place right now? You see him wandering around. I'm just a stranger in a strange land. He's wandering around with that staff uh, tending to his father-in-law's flock. Uh, and then one day, <laughs> he ascends up a mountain. And, and while he's on this mountain, he sees a flame over here that catches his eye. And the Bible says something unique. He says, I looked at it and I realized that this bush, it was on fire, but it wasn't consumed. I, I want to show you something because that fire represents something. Because after the Holy Ghost fell, it says it fell like a fire. And he turns and he sees the fire burning in this bush, but it's not being consumed. Now watch this. 
There's no voice that speaks to him until he turns aside to see this great wonder. Many of us wonder why we can't hear the voice of God. Many of us wonder why we can't hear God speak to us or why we're not having this great encounter. Friend, until you get tunnel vision on what God's trying to do in this house, you're going to have a hard time hearing his voice. Come on, the power of God moved in here during worship. Your pastor came up here and began to lead us. Uh, and this wonderful worship team began to lead us. I felt like the miraculous walked in here. But you better hear me. You're not going to get a touch uh, until you turn and say, this is the only thing I'm focused on. I'm not worried about what's after church. I'm not worried about lunch. I'm not worried about the roast. I want to know what's happening right here. Ooh, my, my. He turns and he sees this great sight. And the moment he turns, I can't help, I can't help but hear repentance screaming out right there. Because the most basic definition of repentance is to turn. He turns and he sees the fire. You've got to turn from wickedness if you're going to hear the voice of God. You've got to turn from wickedness if you're going to have a miraculous encounter with the fire that's calling your name. Out of the fire, he hears it cry, Moses, Moses. Uh, I don't know who you are here today, but you better hear me. God's calling your name. I said, you better hear me in this place. God is calling uh, your name. Uh, you've been wondering long enough, uh, and you're not here by coincidence or accident. God is speaking unto you today, calling your name. And he sees this fire, and it speaks out to him, Moses, Moses, I've heard the cry of my people. I, I, I've heard, I, I've heard it by reason of great bondage, and I want you to go and deliver them. Lord, me, go and deliver them. We already heard it here today. Who in the world do I say sent me? I am that I am. Uh, Come on, I, I can't help, again, go back to that encounter with that woman at the well because he looks at her and he says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And she looks at him and says, I know that when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. And he looks right at her and says, I that speak unto thee am he. You got to hear him say, I am. I am the Spirit. I am the Messiah. I am God manifested in the flesh. And I'm standing right here speaking to you just like I spoke to Moses. I'm speaking to you. And just like I spoke, come on, can you hear the voice of God calling your name here today? I am. I am He that speak unto thee. She hears the I am. She hears the calling. Moses is now standing before this bush and he says, Lord, how am I going to convince them? He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take the rod that's in your hand and I want you to throw it on the ground. Can I just pause here for just a minute and say that when God gets ready to use you and when God gets ready to do things through you, he's not going to expect you to use what you don't already have in your arsenal. We've got people that say, well, when I can preach like that, when I can sing like that, when I can look like that, when I can play like that, when I can teach like that, then I'll be used. No, you've got to start with what's in your hand. And if you don't start with what you got, you're never going to be used by God. You've got to start today. God's saying, I see what you've got, and I've got a ministry designed just for what's in your hand. Ooh, my, my, my. He throws that staff down and it turns into a serpent, Brother Bounds. And Moses was a good man. He flees. I'd have done the same thing. I still flee from snakes. My wife the other day, y'all can call me a sissy if you want to. I just don't like snakes. I kill any spider, but yeah, snakes are not for me. I come out of my front door. We got a camera posted right over our garage because I'm gone a lot, and I like to make sure my family's safe, and, and I got cameras all over the place, and I was walking out with a bag of trash, and then a snake come crawling across the driveway. She watching me on the camera. Man, I just chucked the bag of trash at her like, I'm out of here. I'll get that later. <laughs> me and Moses got something in common. <laughs> we flee from serpents. 
He says, no, Moses, uh, reach down and grab it uh, by its tail. And the moment he touches it, it turns back into a staff. I can't help but hear Mark writing, you shall take up serpents. Come on, what was he really trying to say? Mark was trying to say, I'm going to use you in the supernatural to deliver people just like I use Moses in the supernatural to deliver people. He's saying, I'm going to start with what you got. He wasn't saying, go around picking up snakes. He was saying, there's a realm of the supernatural. I'm going to use you in. You just got to start with what you got. God wants to use you in the supernatural. God wants to use you in the gifts of the Spirit. Why not us? He says, take it up. Oh, man. Now, now, this is what blows my mind. I'm teaching you how to change a lineage. This is what blows my mind. He leaves this encounter with God, and he goes to his wife, Zephora. Hey, Zip. I'm just talking with a bush over here on fire. You and I, we're going to go to the world's known superpower of this day and we're going to go get two to five million people out of there you excited come on you got you to see it like I'm seeing it you're going to go to your wife and say hey I had an encounter with God at the anchor come on I, God touched my life this Sunday morning I don't know how to explain it I don't know how to, I, I don't really know what, it was just something that's kind of unexplainable, but yet it's undeniable. I know what I felt. I know what I saw. I know what I encountered. You've got to be willing to stand in the face of everything and say, I know what I experienced. He and Zip. All right, honey, I believe you. You talk with the bush. You're, you're, I would, if I told my wife this stuff, she'd say, honey, I don't know what you've been smoking. <laughs> Ain't no way you talk with a burning bush uh, and that rod you've been carrying around turned into a snake. Ain't no way. Think about it. He comes back. She says, all right, honey, let's go to Pharaoh together. And they're headed there. Now watch, this is amazing. I'm going to teach some of you young people a principle right here. They're headed, and the Bible says they stop at the inn on the way there. They stop at Hotel Egypt. Pyramids by Hilton, I don't know. And, uh, tombs by Marriott, I don't know. And they stop at the inn. And the Bible says, I believe it was Moses because... The boy didn't know it was the father's responsibility to circumcise that son. And the Bible says Zephora has to circumcise him because Moses is about to die. He's in the inn on his way to be the deliverer. And he's about to die. And Zephora does the work of circumcision and comes to Moses with the excess flesh and says, you're a bloody man and you'll always be a bloody man to me. It was the last reminder of who he comes from. I know who your daddy is. I know where you come from. I know what was spoken over you. Come on. But thank God he married somebody that held him to the covenant when he was going to start slipping on what he knew was right and holy. Can I pause here and just say to you, it matters who you marry. Can I pause here and preach to somebody here today? You better marry somebody that when you get weak, they're strong. And when they get weak, you're strong. You better marry somebody that's willing to go the distance. You better marry somebody that's willing to say, I know what the covenant says. I heard it. I heard it. And I'm going to stand with the covenant. It matters who you marry. Come on. He's a stranger in a strange land. And he's headed to go to Pharaoh. Thank God somebody was willing to hold on to the covenant. 
my Lord, don't let go of the covenant now. Come on, the New Testament is not circumcision of flesh. It's circumcision of the heart. Colossians chapter 2, wherewith you are buried with him in baptism. Wherefore, old things are passed away and all things become new, friend. You better get baptized in the name of Jesus. It's the only thing that will save you from death. Oh, my, my, my. And you see this process. Now, what does Moses have to do? He's got to go stand before Pharaoh. I'm teaching you how to change a lineage, friend. You've got to stand before the king of the world. He's going to try to hold you down. He's going to try to tell you you can't go. He's going to try to negotiate with you. Come on, he tried to negotiate with Moses. Uh, well, just you and this group go and you leave me this group. Well, just you and that group go and you leave me that group. No, you've got to learn how to stand flat-footed uh, in the face of Pharaoh. Uh, you've got to learn how to stand flat-footed uh, in the face of every devil of hell and say, I'm not moving uh, on what God did for me. I don't care. I know addiction wants to rise up. Uh, I know flesh wants to rise up. Uh, I know bitterness wants to rise up. But you stand flat-footed and say, I I'm not moving. It's a war. Come on. You've got to learn. This is the process. This is how you're going to change your family. This is why your kids are not going to be angry drunks like your daddy was. This is why your family is not going to struggle with fornication like your family struggled with fornication. I know, I know, I know what your granddaddy was. I know what your daddy was. I know what your great grandma was and your mama was. But friend, there's got to be something that rises up in you and says, in spite of my heritage in spite of where I come from I will not be what they were I'm preaching to a new convert here today. You were baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and people have come against you. Your family has told you you're crazy. Uh, Don't you dare go to that crazy Pentecostal church. They tell you all this, that, and the other. Friend, when you're willing to stand, when everybody else is against you, you better know you're changing your lineage. My, my, my. And I love it because when Moses comes out of Egypt, you see, you see now, I believe it's Numbers chapter 11, maybe, maybe chapter 12. He has the opportunity to allow his heritage to rise up in him. And I'm, I'm covering a lot of ground to get to where I'm going. He says, do you see it? Because Levi's supposed to be a vengeful man, an angry man. But now... Moses' family is rising up against him. Aaron and Miriam, they're rising up against him. And while they're rising up against him, watch, watch what he says. And they're looking at him saying, you think you're the only one that can hear from God? Come on, I'm preaching to somebody today. You think you're the only one that can hear the voice of God? You think you're the only one? Come on. And they're hearing that. They're hearing the words. You see Moses And at any given moment, Levi could have risen up. At any given moment, vengeance could have risen up. At any given moment, the anger that was spoken over his family could have risen up. But Moses made a decision. I will not be what my father was. I will not be what my grandfather was. I will not be what those before me were. Come on, you've got to make up in your mind. I will not be what they were. You better believe there's going to be adversity. You better believe there's going to be a fight. But you've got to settle it in your spirit. I'm not moving uh, from my experience. I know I feel like a stranger. I know I fought Pharaoh. But I'm not moving. Brother up to grave, he has this opportunity at this moment. Mary and Aaron are calling him out. And this is when you think you would see his heritage of vengeance and anger rise up. But now for the first time, the one that had the prophecy of anger and vengeance that is spoken over him, you see this spoken. And Moses was the meekest in all the land. What did he do when he could have retaliated to Miriam and Aaron? You weren't there at the burning bush. 
you weren't there when I was all alone by myself feeling like an outcast like I didn't belong. You weren't there when I was, come on, persecuted by faith. You weren't there. But instead, he takes some steps back. And now he's called the meekest in all the land. The meekest man until Jesus, this meek man, steps back. And out of nowhere, the God of heaven descends. And he looks at Aaron, and he looks at Miriam, and he says, I speak to my prophets darkly and in part, but when I speak to Moses, I put my lips to his lips. There's nothing that infiltrates or filters the word as pure as he got it. He speaks it. He's not just another man. You know what he did? He let God fight his battle instead of letting his heritage of anger and vengeance rise up. He says, I'm going to let the Lord God that changed me in a wilderness, that changed me at the bush, that changed me at the well, I'm going to let him fight my battle for me now. I'm preaching to somebody. Uh, your granddad uh, was an angry man, was an abusive man. Your mom was an alcoholic, uh, a drug addict. But that doesn't mean you have to be. Uh, that doesn't mean your kids have to be. You can stand uh, and say, God will fight for me. You're not a vengeful man anymore, Moses. You're not a vengeful man anymore, Moses. I'll tell you who you are. You're a meek man. You're a humble man. Why? Because I'm letting God work on my behalf. Can I tell you, if you let God work on you, he'll show your family love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness. Come on, long-suffering, patience. He'll show them the fruit of the Spirit, friend. If you let God work on you, he'll change you from who you were into who he wants you to be. He'll take that anger and he'll give you love. He'll take that bitterness and he'll give you wholeness. He'll take that suicide and he'll give you a sound mind. He'll take that anxiety and he'll give you peace. My, my, my. It'll change you, but it won't just change you. Uh, come on, your kids. Uh, now you got to be of Levi if you're going to get in the glory of God. Now you've got to be of Levi if you're going to get in the presence of God. Can I tell you like we read it in Romans, we are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. You better hear me when you're baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now you get to traffic in holy places. Now you get to operate. Come on. Now you can go where others can't go. You can visit where others can't visit. Why? Because you decided to make a change when nobody else was willing. I made a change. Come on, lift your hands and worship him right now. Would you lift your voices higher than your hands? Would you lift your voices higher than your hands? My, my, my. Kandolobo ho shatayaha. Ha. Ayalabo ho shataha. Come on, now's not time to give in to Pharaoh. Now's not time to give in to the kingdom of the world. Now's not time to give in to that voice that's telling you it was easier before you got in the church. Now's not time to give in to that old addiction. Now's not time to get in to that lying spirit. Now's not time to give in to the lust and the temptation. It's time to stand and say, change me by your glory. Let me tell you something. Us multi-generational, we better be careful. Because we better remember who our family was before we grew up in this. Because I remember some sons of the tribe of Levi named Hophni and Phinehas who had forgotten where they came from who had forgotten they too were sons of vengeance. They too were sons of anger. They too were sons of dishonesty. My, my. And they had forgotten where they came from. And out from their lineage arose something 
dishonesty. They begin to mishandle the sacrifice of God. Why? Because they didn't care about his glory anymore. They didn't care about where God brought them out of anymore. We better not become careless in this. Uh, if you've been a part of this for a long time uh, or you've been a part of this for a little while, you better grab that flesh by the nap of the neck every day and say, uh, you got to get on an altar. Uh, I'm not going back to who I used to be. Uh, I'm not going back to what I used to be. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody here today. You feel like giving up. You feel like throwing in the towel. There's more than you hanging on the balance. My great-grandfather, Grandpa Morgan, he was a, a drunk. He was a mean alcoholic, and he was a fighter. He would abuse, he would abuse my great-grandmother. He would beat her. I mean, senseless. My grandpa told me, I was asking him about this story. I said, Pops, I want to know where we come from. Tell me about our history. He said, one time, your great-grandpa, he was beating on your grandma so much for the bounce. He said, I went and got in between them to try to stop them from hurting my mom. And he just turned and started beating me. He was a wife abuser. He would abuse his sons. He was a raging alcoholic. My great-grandpa had the top part of his ear missing because it got bit off in a bar fight. My grandpa said he would buy his cigarettes by the carton a month's worth at a time. He said he had all kinds of liquor up in the cabinet. That's what my grandpa was telling me about my great-grandpa. But then one day, my great-grandma got a part of a revival that was taking place in Kennett, Missouri. She got prayed through to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> she got baptized in Jesus' name. And my great-grandma started praying, Lord, change my husband. Lord, work on my husband. I'm preaching to somebody right now. Lord, change him. He's a hard man. He's a bitter man. He's an angry man. He's an alcoholic. Change him, God. Change my husband. A little while went by, and my great-grandpa was on a tractor. He was plowing a cotton field. They were sharecroppers, and he was out there plowing a cotton field and he heard the voice of the Lord speak to him sitting on a tractor and the voice of the Lord spoke to him and said, repent of your sins and be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. My great-grandpa was a stubborn man. He was a hard man. He just kept on riding that tractor and ignored the voice of God. He heard it a second time, and it said, Repent of your sins and be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And my great-grandpa ignored it a second time. He said, No, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm a stubborn man. I'm a hard man. And then the third time, there was no voice. The hand of God knocked him off of that tractor. He fell down into the dirt, and when he fell into the dirt, he rolled over on his face and and he knew, I better repent because I don't know what's coming next. Uh, he began to repent of his sins. Uh, and right there in the middle of a cotton field, uh, he was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in an unknown tongue. Why? Because of a great grandma that said, uh, prayer works. Uh, come on, you're building up a memorial of prayer. Uh, and you don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, it may not happen in the church. Uh, they might be tending to a garden right now. Uh, they might... My but you can change a lineage with prayer. He didn't stop praying. He had to finish working for the bounds. He hopped back on a tractor. My grandpa said he never stopped speaking in tongues. He finished his day's work just to speak in tongues. All day long, he was speaking in tongues. It got a hold of him. He was speaking in tongues, riding that tractor. And he got home, and my grandpa said he still wasn't done speaking in tongues. He got back home from work, and he was speaking in tongues all the way to the liquor cabinet. He grabbed the liquor, and he poured it down the drain. Then he went to the cigarettes, and he grabbed the cigarettes, all of his stats for that month. They had a wood-burning stove. He threw it in the stove. He said, I'm not going back. He never Never quit speaking in tongues. He just kept on. My Lord. But my grandpa was scarred by what his dad had done to him. And now my grandpa Morgan, he was an alcoholic and a fighter. Golden glove boxer. The officer told him he got caught in a fight. You got one or two options. He said, you can either fight. He said, oh, you're going to jail. He said, I'll fight. And so my grandpa Morgan became a golden glove boxer. Crazy. He said, one Sunday we were in the middle of a red hot revival. He said, and I went drinking all Saturday night. He said, a mama smacked me upside the head and said, you're going to church today. 
He was hung over, sitting in the house of God. He said, I was sitting in the back, middle row, but in the back. He said, I was sitting there, and the evangelist that was preaching that day just walked by me and said, Jesus loves you, and smacked me on the shoulder. Didn't stop, he just kept preaching. He said, but something about the love of God got a hold of me. You got to hear what I'm preaching. He said, how could he love me? <laughs> He said, but he loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Somebody needs to hear what I'm preaching. In spite of how you showed up here to church, he loves you. In spite of what you did yesterday, he loves you. In spite of your sin, he loves you. In spite of your mistake, he loves you. In spite of your heritage, he loves you. In spite My Lord. He loves you. Uh, my grandpa said, I came back to church on that Sunday night. I lifted my hands. I repented of my sins and God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost uh, and I was baptized in Jesus' name. He said, I never went back to drinking. I never went back to fighting. I never went back to smoking. Uh, now my great-grandpa's been saved. Uh, my grandpa's been saved uh, and from my grandpa came a lineage of preachers. Now my Uncle Mark stands flat-footed and proclaims the gospel. My dad stands flat-footed and proclaims the gospel. My grandpa had six kids. All six of his kids are saved, living for the Lord, and active in ministry. Are you ready? All of his grandkids, all that can be filled with the Holy Ghost, they're saved, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and most of us are preachers of the gospel. Now, all of his grandkids, my grandpa Morgan, his grandkids are all filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. Let's go a little further. All of the great-grandkids. No, you need to hear what I'm saying. All of the great-grandkids. Why? Because one man said, I refuse to be what my father was. All of the great grandkids that are filled with the Holy, that are old enough. Uh, we got six year olds, seven year old, and a few other. All of them filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. My six year old niece this January walked up on the platform and gave my dad an interpretation, and then the, I mean the tongue and the interpretation of the tongue, praying on the platform at six years old. She's baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, and told my father what he prayed in his prayer closet by himself on Saturday night. She's six years old and. God's already using her in the gifts of the Spirit. Why? Not because there's anything great about the Morgans, uh, but because one man said, uh, I'm willing uh, to change my lineage. Uh, I don't care that anger's in my lineage. Uh, I don't care that vengeance. My Lord. I'm preaching to somebody here today. Uh, it doesn't matter where you come from. Uh, it doesn't matter who your mom or your daddy is. You're one encounter away. You're one moment away from your kids growing up in truth. Stand with me all over the house and lift your hands. The power of God's in this place. Lift your hands and lift your voice. Don't pray quietly. Don't pray quietly. Lift your voice. I'm preaching to somebody here today. Come on, it's like Paul told Timothy. It was in your grandmother. It was in your mother. And I perceive it's in you. What made that lineage great? Because grandma decided... I'm going to be a part of the church. And then mama decided, I'm going to be a part of the church. And then out of nowhere comes a Timothy. You never know what's going to take place when you decide. When you decide, I'm going to change my lineage. You come from a broken home. I know you come from a family of alcoholics and drug addicts. I know you come from a family of liars. Maybe, maybe your father was an angry man who abused you. But you hear me in the Holy Ghost here today. One encounter in this altar. One moment with the Lord. One burning bush experience. One moment with God. And you hear me. Everything can change. 
I said everything can change. I don't care if you've got the addiction in your car. I don't care if you brought it with you into the church house. I don't care what it is. It will be broken by the power of the word of God and by the authority that's in the name of Jesus. I'm asking you here today. I feel like God's working on somebody's heart right now. You know where your family comes from. You know, you know who your family is. You're saying, I want to be the change. I want to be the difference. I, I, I want to be the one that changes my lineage. I want to be the one that gets comfortable trafficking in the glory of God. I want to be the one that gets used in ministry. I want to be the one. If that's you here today, I want you to come to this altar as quickly as you can. Please don't wait. Don't hesitate. Make your way to this altar. Come on. Come on. It doesn't matter who you are. There's some people that need to get here quickly. Come on. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on. Don't be afraid to come to this altar right now. I'm asking you to step out in faith. Come on. Be the Moses that was willing to turn aside and see the bush that was on fire. Come on. It caught his eye. Come on. Press in. Come on, there's some visitors here today. The Lord is speaking to you. You've never been here before. You're the reason God sent me to preach this today. You don't have to go home the way you came. Come on. Why come to the altar? The altar's where the fire falls. The altar's where you place the sacrifice. Come on. There's some more. I want to wait. God's working on your heart right now. Come on, sir. Come on, ma'am. God can take that addiction out of your family right now. God can break the anger off of your life right now. God can take the vengeance out of your family. Come on, there's some more. I'm going to make this second petition. Are there some Hophni and Phineases that would be honest and say, hey, I've kind of got comfortable in his glory and I don't want what my daddy was or what my granddaddy was to rise up in me. Come on, you need to get to this altar and you need to refire up the covenant. You need to refire up the covenant in your life. Come on, that's it. Come on, there's some more that need to press into this altar right now. I'm going to wait a little while longer. Come on, press in, press in, press in. That's it. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. That's it. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Ayala mohoro shata yala baha. Ikandare yata yala baha. Uh, I don't know why I feel like waiting just a little bit longer. Come on, you need to press into this place. Don't gather in the pew. Don't gather in the middle. Come on down to the altar. That's it. Come on, that's it. Press in. Press in. I feel a pause. We're not going to pray. I feel like God's pulling on somebody's heart right now. Get to this altar. Don't wait. Come on, that's it. That's it. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. That's it. That's it. Come on, don't gather in the aisle. Press in. There's plenty of room in this altar. Don't gather in the aisle. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Press in. That's it. That's it. Press in. Glory to God. Press in. That's it. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. If you're in this place and you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, this is the day of salvation. If you're in this place and you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, this is the day of salvation every hand all over this house lifted as a universal sign of surrender from the left to the right from the front to the back even if you didn't come to the altar I want your hand lifted right now with your hands lifted I want you to have a moment of repentance with the Lord Lord forgive me come on talk to him we've all fallen short of the glory of God we've all made mistakes we've all done things we wish we wouldn't have done Come on, he is faithful to forgive. Talk to the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the things that I've said. I'm sorry for the things that I've done. Come on, talk to him right now. Come on, the glory of the Lord is fallen in this house right now.